Let's go to the Lord in prayer, um, if we could, this morning. Father, thank you today for the privilege. Lord, thank you today for the opportunity just to be able to come, to be able to proclaim your word. And God, I would ask today that you would do something that only you can do, and that is to make your word clear to each and every one of us that's here today. Lord, I realize that uh, I stand here today as a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, Lord, I need forgiveness of my sin. And so I am just trusting and I am praying, Lord, that you would forgive me of the sin that's in my life and place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, as I said, and the privilege that we do have. Help us not to take it lightly. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts today. And I pray that you would speak to us in a way that only you can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage today that we have read is a familiar passage, and it's known as the parable of the soils. Maybe one of the most familiar parables of all that Jesus taught. In Jesus' time, they would have been very familiar with what he was speaking about. In fact, they all knew what it meant to throw a seed on the ground, and that seed fall upon rocky ground or uh, weeds or uh, good ground. And so they knew something. I mean, this is the Galilee area when Jesus was teaching this parable, and they would have been very familiar with the words that Jesus would have been saying. And so it was a very simple story that Jesus was trying to convey, and it was very familiar to those that was listening to him in that day. Now what is a parable? There have been many definitions that have been given to parables, and when it says, and Jesus spoke in a parable, what does that actually mean? Well, probably the best definition I've ever heard is that a parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. Well, we may understand that, but what is the specific point of this specific parable that Jesus is speaking here? Well, this parable was designed to help God's people understand what evangelism is all about. You and I as Christians have been given a mandate and that mandate is to go into all the world and to preach and teach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Lord. And as a result, we will see many converts come to Christ. Now, of all the other goals of a Christian, of all the other mandates of a Christian, evangelism is at the top. Have you ever thought about that? Of everything that Jesus said we should do, become holy, to be obedient to him and his word, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and even spiritual maturity, all those are important things. And all of those things help us in our relationship and our walk with God. They help us to have an effective witness. But the ultimate end for which we as Christians live in this world is the proclamation of the gospel. That is why we are here. We are here to tell other people what Christ has done for us and to share the wonderful gospel, the message of salvation. Now, many would say, but aren't there more important messages? Well, listen, our call as Christians is not into the political arena. It's not about morality. It is to proclaim the message of the gospel. And if we do not understand that, this parable will mean absolutely nothing to us. Because if we do not understand how important it is for you and I as children of God to share the gospel, then this parable has no meaning. Now in doing that, I must admit I have been sharing the gospel for many, many years. And not just as a pastor, but for Christians also, many times sharing the gospel can be very disappointing. It can be a very daunting task. It can be a very discouraging task because not everyone that you share the gospel with will receive the message that you are telling them. Why do I t tell you that? Well, do you realize that over half of the Southern Baptist churches in America today baptized zero or just one person last year? Now, Southern Baptists are the biggest denomination known to mankind. And out of all Southern Baptists last year, either zero or one baptism in 50% of our churches. Well, what do we do with that? 
Well, the contemporary evangelical mood would say, we are the blame, that we are doing something wrong, that we are out of touch with our culture. And so the majority of churches that are being planted are churches where uh, they will go in and they will say, what is it that you're looking for in a church? And let's make this church into such a church where people will be drawn to this church. And then they will say something like this, the seed, which by the way in this parable is the word of God. The seed has become offensive. And the message that the seed gives is offensive. You know, all of this hell and damnation and judgment and repentance and on and on and on you go. The world today says that's offensive. And if that's the message you want to proclaim, then we will not come to your church. Because we don't want to hear about damnation and judgment and repentance. And by the way, church, in 20 years, the fabric of our landscape in our society has drastically changed. Do you know that there are over 600 people on the roll of Kinnaboo Baptist Church? Now, I'm not telling you something I think. I looked at the numbers this morning. Because as I was praying and I was uh, praying for our congregation, I thought, you know what, I want to pray for every single member we have, even those that are not here. And then I looked at that number and I thought, you have got to be kidding me. We've got almost, actually almost 700 members of this church. That, my friend, tells a story. I can promise you if I made a phone call to many of them, hundreds of them, and said, listen, if you don't come to church, we're going to take your name off the roll, boy, the phones would start ringing. People would lose their mind. I've been a member of that church for years. Well, you're not here. Well, but I've been a member, my parents were members, and so-and-so were members. And if I said, yeah, but you're not here, yes, but I want to remain a member. Well, then shouldn't we support the church that we claim to be a member of? I mean, that's just simple logic to me. I don't say that to be offensive, but if it is, there's nothing I can do about that. And by the way, if we want to fill our building today, I have a fabulous, fabulous plan in which way we can do that. If we create an environment where people can be comfortable with their sin, I can assure you, we could have a church that would be absolutely full. Now, I'm telling you that this is true because if we can tell people it's okay that you are the way that you are, God loves you anyways, just do the best you can, that's a message that our culture wants to hear, and that's a message that many so-called churches are telling. And that is a telling story. Going back to this parable, our culture would say the problem is the sower. The problem is, is the preacher. The problem is the seed. The problem is the Bible that you're using. And these preachers have become outdated, and the Bible that you're using has become outdated. And so I've come up with a good plan, church. I hope you'll like it. Next week, to appeal to our culture around us, I'm going to wear a shirt with a skull on it and some shorts and maybe some flip-flops, and we're going to fit in with the culture around us, and they're going to flock in. And by the way, I'll no longer use the King James Bible. I'll use a gender-neutral Bible because I certainly wouldn't want to offend anyone in our culture today. You know what would happen? Word would spread pretty quick after most of you left. Word would spread qu pretty quick that this is a church that you can go to that doesn't have a negative message, that doesn't really talk about sin, and I can go to this church and I can feel better than I felt when I came. And they'll affirm me no matter where I'm at in my walk in life. And so if we can just get the pastor a new wardrobe and we can get a different Bible, then certainly that would solve our problem. Now, do you like my plan? I put a lot of thought into that. That was a great plan, I thought. Well... The problem is, Jesus tells us in this parable that the issue is not the sower. It's not the pastor. It's not the person that's actually doing the sowing. And it's not the message, the Bible, that they're getting. It is the soil, Jesus says, and the soil is their heart. It's their mind. Their hearts are wicked. Amen. Their hearts are far from God. And I want to tell you something this morning, church. Never did I think that our world would be in the situation that we're in today in my lifetime of ministry. 
And a mutated gospel is no gospel. Amen. When we quiet the gospel and we change the gospel that Christ originally proclaimed, we have no gospel at all. And by the way, in the Old Testament, parables were signs of judgment. You can go back to Isaiah, you can read in the Psalms where when parables were given, they were signs of judgment. And that's telling because Jesus is giving a parable here and the people listening will never understand what he's saying. And in fact, I think it was verse 10 or somewhere down there in the passage, Jesus tells them, they're not going to understand this as he explains this to his disciples. So let's get into this parable this morning and let's ask the question, what is Jesus really teaching in this parable? Well, I would begin with a couple of questions this morning, and I would start with this question. Did God really speak to any of you this morning? And if God spoke to you this morning, what did God say to you? Was it God that spoke to you, or was it those chocolate chip cookies or chocolate cake maybe that you had before you went to bed that was speaking to you? How do we know if God is truly speaking to us? Because according to this parable, this word can fall on many different types of soil. And so how do we know that God is speaking to you? Now some of you may be sitting here saying, great, I don't think God has ever spoken to me. Well, the problem is not God speaking to you. The problem is your heart. That's what it always comes back to. In fact, in verse 8, look at our text, what it says in verse 8. And when, and when Jesus had said these things, he cried and said, He that hath ears, let him hear. Now, Jesus is saying it is possible for you to hear this message. But you must be tuned in. The problem is not God speaking. The problem is you're not on God's wavelength. That's the issue here. And so Jesus tells this parable and he explains why mankind does not hear God. Why mankind rejects this message. And I want to tell you more than anything other than you being a Christian, I want you to know that God is speaking to you. And I want you to hear when God is speaking to you. Now again, I would ask that question, have you ever really known God to speak to you? in any way? How does God speak to you? Well, I want to work through this parable, and as we do, I want you to know a couple things here. First of all, God is the farmer in this passage. You probably ought to note that in the side of your Bible, just so when you're reading this, that you have that understanding. God is the farmer. The seed that we're talking about that's being sown, that is God's Word. That is the words God is speaking to us. Now what's the soil, these different soils that we have? Well, you could say that's the mind or that's the individual's heart. And so let's get right into this parable this morning. There's a couple things I want you to jot down. Number one, how are we going to hear God speak? First of all, we must seek with an open mind. Now that's the first thing we have to note about this parable. If we want to hear God and we want to know if God is speaking to us, we must seek God with an open mind. It goes back to that question, have you ever heard God speak to you? Well, the first step is that you need to have a desire. If you're not looking for God to speak to you, you will never hear God speak to you. Right. And remember here, these parables were judgments. Israel had rejected God. They had rejected Christ, and as a result, Jesus, you know, a few chapters earlier, they said the miracles that he were doing, the words that he was saying, they called him Beelzebub. They said that he was a devil himself. And so we need to start by just simply saying, God, I'm open. God, I want to hear what you have to say to me. Lord, I want to learn your word. I am a vessel that wants to be used by you. And God, if there's anybody that wants to hear your word, Lord, I want to hear your word. I'm staying tuned in. And that's a question for you today. Are you willing to do that. The issue goes back to mankind having hard hearts. Go back to verse 5 and we see this. Now I want to make a couple parallels in this passage and I'm going to ask you to draw this, uh, underline this in your Bible, but verse 5. It says, And a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, notice this, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Now, what's the meaning of that? What's the purpose? Well, draw a line from verse 5 down to verse 12 because that gives us the explanation in this parable. 
Jesus said, those by the wayside, in verse 12, are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now what's the imagery here? The imagery is that here you have this farmer, and he goes out and he sows this seed, and he's walking on this path, and this path has been hardened because of so many people walking on it. And that seed cannot get any root, and it doesn't sprout. And so the birds come along, and they eat the seed, and they just carry it away, and it's gone. Now these type of individuals represent a person with a closed mind. In church, we are living in a world that has a closed mind spiritually. When it comes to the things of God, they have an absolute closed mind. They don't want to know the truth. They think they already have the truth. And their hearts are hardened. And because their hearts are hardened, they're speaking what they think is truth, and there's no truth to it at all. Amen. And as a result, God's Word never takes root in their life. But they would call themselves Christians. Now, isn't that interesting? There's a very uh, scary verse, I think, in the Bible where it says, One day men will stand before God and they'll say, We've done all these things, Lord, and we've done miracles in your name. And Jesus looks at them and, Do you remember what he says? Depart from me. I never knew you. You never belonged to me. It would have been these individuals that would have said, Yeah, I, I, I want to be a church member. I want my name attached to the church because it may have some benefit for me. And now, before anybody swells up here today, I'm not saying everybody on that list that don't come is not saved. But I'm certainly saying this loud and clear. If they're not serving in a church somewhere, they're not right with God. And they should be serving somewhere. And so Christians today have this closed mind. Not Christians, but unbelievers have a closed mind and they're calling themselves Christians. Closed mindedness will cause a person to become further and further and further from the Lord, but they will have this idea and this thought that they know it all. They may have knowledge, they may be very uh, smart, but when it comes to God's truth, they are ignorant of God's word. Right. And by the way, did you know that God can actually speak to you while I am preaching to you this morning? Why is that the case? Because I'm preaching God's Word. I'm speaking God's truth and I'm speaking God's Word. That's all the more reason not to fall asleep while I'm preaching because you may miss something that God is saying to you and that would not be my fault. Amen. That would be your fault. You say, oh, but pastor, you preach too long. You're too, you're too boring. Well, listen, back in the 1800s, do you know they preached for two hours? Read some of the sermons that were written back in the 1800s. Two hour long sermons. I, that would shorten the roll quite a bit, wouldn't it? I bet that 600 would come down fast if I started preaching two hours. But let me ask you a question. What makes individuals have hard hearts and makes the pathway hardened? Now, I want you to get this before we go on to the next point. What causes their mind to be closed to the truth of God? Well, I think one thing is fear. Fear that if I accept God's truth, I have to live by God's truth. Now you see how that works? And so there's a fear there that, well, if God's word is true, then that means I have to submit to God's word. Here's another thing, pride. Pride will do it. I already know it all. I don't need anyone to tell me what truth is. I can figure out truth on my own. And then there's bitterness. People claiming to be Christians, but they're so bitter. Fear, pride, and bitterness. But you and I as Christians must have an open heart to receive God's word. I love what the Apostle James said in James chapter 1, in verse 21. He said, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and all superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. What's the most important thing in your life? The word of God. What is the most important thing that we do when we come here together for corporate worship such as this? Singing is great. Giving is great. Praying is great. Fellowship is great. But there's one thing that if we lack, we are lack being a church, and that is the preaching and the teaching of God's truth and God's word. So we must seek God 
with an open mind. Here's the second thing. We have to allocate time to listen. Do we want God to speak to us? Well, then we better allocate some time in our life to listen. How many of you are busy? Yes, all of you are busy. But guess what? We all have the exact same amount of hours in a day. The same amount of seconds in a day. We all have the exact same amount of time. But sometimes we just have to be quiet and let God speak to us. You know why we do not hear God speak sometimes? Because life is so hectic and we're in too big of a hurry. And we say, God, I can't slow down. Well, look at verse 6 of our text. It says, and some fell, speaking about these seeds, some smell, uh, fell up, upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Now draw a line from verse 6 down to verse 13 because here's where Jesus gives the answer here. In verse 13 he said, they on the rock are those which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation, fall away. Now notice the word root. They have no depth. They have no root. If you looked at the amount of people that have made what we call a profession of faith in this church alone, over the last 50 years, we, and they were all here, we would not have enough room to keep them. Now, I'm not saying every person that claims to be saved is not saved, but what I'm saying is many think, this sounds like a good thing. I don't want to go to hell. That sounds like a good plan. I think I'll become a Christian. And they're excited and there's joy, but there's no root there. And then what happens? They just wither away. Now, that would not be very popular to say in a lot of churches because it would be very offensive. To look at someone and say, if you're not attending church, you're not right with God. Listen, part of what we do here is part of our Christian walk. It's the reason we're here. And if we are not physically hindered for some reason from being here, this is where we should be. But then again, who wants to hear that, right? And so we look at this word root, and this is the shallow soil that represents someone that has a superficial mind. See, that first type of soil that we talked about was that person that, you know, they just didn't seek God with their whole mind. This is a person that has a superficial mind. They just want enough. They just want some insurance to make sure that they get in to heaven. They start off great, but then they fizzle out. Folks, we're living in a world today where we don't need people that will fizzle out. We need people that will pop. You know what I mean by that? It's canning season. Have any of you ever canned? What happens when you can those green beans? You put them in that pressure cooker. It gets hot. <coughs> you set them out on the counter. And then after a while, what will you hear? You'll hear this pop, right? That's the problem with a lot of Christians. They've never popped. They're saying they're Christians, but they're superficial. There's no evidence of the Holy Spirit in their life. Well, how do you get roots? What does this come down to? Well, let me tell you, you can come to church every day of your life, but you get roots by studying God's Word and reading God's Word for yourself. Right. Now, the fellowship here will help you through the tough times in your life. It will give you some teaching and it will give you some guidance, but you must be a student of this Word yourself. And why is that so important? Because most people think, well, Pastor, you've been to seminary, you've got the degrees, you know the word, teach it to us. But what happens when you have a false teacher come in? You assume that they know the word, but if you don't know the word, then you're being taught untruth. And so just as it's important that I know the word and I teach truth, it's equally important that you know the word and you can identify false teaching when you hear it. But if you have no roots... You'll just come in, you'll kind of go through the motions, and that's all we'll have. But if we're going to hear God, we have to seek with an open mind. We have to allocate time to listen and be students of God's Word. There's a third thing here. Very quickly, let me add this. You must eliminate the distractions in your life. Now, this is going to be hard for some of you, but I'm going to say this as pastorally as I can. You need to be quiet. You simply need to quiet down and allow God to speak to you. <clears throat> 
Have you ever noticed how much we love to hear ourselves talk? If you don't think that's true, just watch individuals while you're having a conversation with them. Most individuals I have noticed are this way. I can be having a conversation with them and I can see the wheels turning in their head thinking about what they're going to say to me. And before I can finish what they're saying, they interrupt me and they say whatever's on their mind. Do we not all do that to some degree? We want the world to hear what we have to say. I have always said and I'll say to the day that I die, I am my favorite preacher because I love to hear myself talk. <laughs> not because I'm the best, I just love to talk. Love to hear myself talk. But when it comes to getting some depth and some root, we have to understand, we have to elim eliminate some of the distractions in our life, and sometimes we just have to slow down. But go to verse 7 of our text. It says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it out. The weeds choked out the very life of this plant. Now draw a line from verse 7 to verse 14, and Jesus explains this. He says in verse 14, And those which fell among the thorns are those, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked out with cares and the riches and pleasures of this life, bringing forth no fruit to perfection. This would be the individual that's preoccupied with life, that's so caught up in the things of this world that they never grow spiritually. You know, if there's one thing that ministry has taught me, and being around people has taught me that is life is so short. Life, as James says, it's a vapor. It's here for a short time and then it's gone. I cannot believe, and I know I probably say this every year, but I cannot believe that I am 48 years old. I do not know where the time has gone. There was a day when I remember thinking it was ancient, that 48 was ancient, that I would never reach it. It was some way out in the future. And that, I remember thinking 48-year-old women looked old. <laughs> now I know one that I think looks pretty good. <laughs> now I'm speaking to my wife, if there's any clarification there. Well, I give her one compliment. She's not even, she, she's doing something else. <laughs> we hope, we hope the word gets back right. But those are the types of individuals that we're talking about. They're just preoccupied with the things of the world. You remember what Paul said in Galatians 5? He said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Those are things we should be consumed with, not these things of the world. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a house and you can't have a car and all of that, but think about what we put our, our time and invest our resources in. When it comes our time to leave this world, how much of that really, really matters? There's one final thing here that I want to mention to us, number four. Yes, we have to seek with an open mind and we have to allocate time to listen and we need to eliminate some of the distractions in our life. But fourthly this morning, we need to submit to what God says. That's what it comes down to. Do you want to hear God speak to us? Then submit to what God is saying to you. Look at verse 15. But that on the good ground they are, they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now this represents the Christian. This represents the person that has a willing mind. It's what James was talking about in verse 22 of chapter 1 in the epistle of James when he said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't just hear it, but live it. Make it part of your life. It's increased productivity. Now church, I'm just asking you today because I don't know. Has that word of God fallen upon the path of your life ever? Can you honestly say there has been a time when I have accepted Christ as my Savior and the fruit is that this word has grown in me? Maybe you can identify with one of these other areas. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm saying some are not Christians. But I am saying this. If God's word has penetrated your heart, there is a desire in you to grow. There is a desire in you to want to live closer to the Lord than you have ever lived. 
There's a desire in you to want to hear God speak to you on a daily basis. And by the way, God can speak to you. He speaks to us through His Word. You will never need a preacher, a prophet, an evangelist to stand and tell you this is what God is saying to you. You have God's holy, infallible Word that you can hold in your hands, you can read every day, and God can speak truth into your life. I'm asking you today to examine the soil, to do a soil test, but more importantly, to examine your heart. See, one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to hear Him say, well done, or we're going to hear Him say, depart from me. I'm not begging you this morning to come to Him if you don't know Him. Because if the Holy Spirit's not drawing you, you couldn't be saved anyways. But I want to tell you something. You sitting here is a good start. It's a good start that God has drawn you here and that God is speaking to you. And let me tell you something, friend. If God speaks to you, someone as big as God speaks to you, you're going to know it. There's not going to be any question about it at all. And so today, if God is speaking to you in any way, whether it's to come to Him for salvation or whether it's to develop some roots and to have some growth in your life, whatever it is, I'm encouraging you to be obedient to Him. Will you do that this morning? Let's stand together. Lord, we do come to you today and we thank you, God, for giving us this opportunity to be able to not only teach and preach from your word, but to have those here that can listen and have those here that needed to hear this today. Lord, we know and we believe that your word is truth. And we want your truth to touch our hearts today. Lord, I don't know if we're living in the last days, but I believe we are. I believe that the disciples believe they were living in the last days. But Lord, help us as Christians, if we are truly Christians, help us to be found faithful. And if not, Lord, help us to make a decision today for those that have never come to the saving knowledge of your grace that they would say either I want to live for the Lord or I'm going to do it my way. But God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us, convict all of us. Either show us our need for a Savior or show us the areas in our life that we need to improve in. And Lord, no doubt all of us have areas that we need to improve in, so I just pray that you would help us, that you would speak to us. Lord, I would just ask now that during this time of invitation, you would help us to remain faithful and be obedient to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.